Nature needs a bailout, but the transition to renewable energy isn't as clear as it's made out to be. Building the necessary infrastructure takes resources. Getting those resources requires thousands of new mining deposits, which isn't all that environmentally friendly. Take the Penisquito mine in Mexico. The complex covers 100 square kilometers and is flanked by two toxic waste dumps a mile long. A massive tailings dam, 11 kilometers wide and 150 meters high, holds back a reservoir of harmful sludge. The mine will produce 10,000 tons of silver, a precious metal indispensable in the transition to green tech. But to achieve 2050 decarbonization targets, the world will need an additional 300 mines as large as Penisquito just to meet the quota for silver. The other minerals need just as many mining sites. So, on a global scale, thousands of new massive mining deposits are needed. Decarbonizing the global economy is imperative, but the objective seems nearly impossible. By 2050, demand for lithium, graphite, cobalt, nickel, manganese, copper, silicon, chromium, zinc and rare earths will increase more than 100-fold just to keep up with the supply chains for electric vehicles. This number is many times higher when considering the resource demand for solar power and wind power. We need more of everything, but the world doesn't have that many mapped resources. And even if we did have 100 times the resources charted, we lack the capacity to extract the needed materials in time. The intricacy between geopolitics, green minerals and decarbonization seems insurmountable. Bad things are going to happen, that much is non-negotiable. What is negotiable, however, is how nations deal with them. A peace deal with nature. That is what net zero or carbon neutrality comes down to. And it is the defining task of the 21st century. But old habits die hard. It remains to be seen if the international community is equal to the challenge. To get a sense of the green transition's scale, take a single 50 megawatt gas turbine. Replacing it requires 15 wind turbines the size of the Washington Monument. Building such a farm requires 15,000 tons of iron ore, 25 tons of concrete and 450 tons of non-recyclable plastic for the blades. A solar wind farm with the same megawatt capacity is even more material intensive. 150% more steel, glass and cement in fact. And this is just to replace one 50 megawatt gas turbine. There are over 9,500 sites of equal or greater magnitude globally. The scale of things is difficult to comprehend. While most nations agree on decarbonization, there is barely any discussion over the material requirements that net zero demands. And it's not like economies can be shut down. All societies must maintain economic growth or else fall into crisis. But Growth requires economic activity, which entails work, and all work, whether human, animal or mechanical, requires energy, which must be drawn from the planet's physical resources. Since the Industrial Revolution, fuels like coal, oil and gas have served this general purpose. By the 1960s though, it was clear that fossil fuel consumption increased the stock of atmospheric carbon. And as the link between greenhouse emissions and climate change became evident, states began pledging themselves to decarbonization. The most common pledge now is that all UN member states will achieve net zero emissions with a cutoff point slated for 2050. The 2015 Paris Agreement is the preeminent treaty on this matter. By pledging to achieve net zero emissions, the treaty aims to limit global warming to less than 2 degrees Celsius via a system of nationally determined contributions. But the taproot problem remains unaddressed, namely the need for economic growth and the need for physical resources. 
some developed nations have lowered their overall emissions, but they've only done so by de-industrializing their economies and offshoring to China for lower wages and production costs. Whatever headway has been made has come off the back of green minerals extraction. Yet, building green energy capacity has its problems. The technologies we possess, as impressive as they are engineering-wise, are just not good enough. Developing renewable energy requires roughly 10 times as much raw materials as developing non-renewable energy. Still worse, the rate of waste materials is also set to grow exponentially. By 2050, disused wind turbines will account annually for 300 million tons of non-recyclable plastic waste. The sheer mass of junk materials will also complicate recycling rare earths like dysprosium, neodymium and indium, as doing so will mean extracting them at lower concentrations than mining them for ores. This means recycling could prove uneconomical down the line. Moreover, vehicular combustion engines and renewable energy storage must be factored in. This will require tremendous battery capacity for both vehicles and at grid level. Storing the energy from a 100 megawatt wind farm, for instance, requires 10,000 tons of Tesla class batteries. Despite all the advertising, the current tech just isn't there yet. There could be a breakthrough in new battery innovations that could reduce mineral requirements, but assuming the chemistry remains the same, by 2050 demand for lithium, graphite, cobalt, nickel, manganese, copper, silicon, chromium, zinc and rare earths will increase more than 100 fold just to keep up with the supply chains for electric vehicles. This number, as mind-boggling as it is, does not account for mineral demand for solar power and wind power. Building the necessary infrastructure will require spatial fix, places where extraction, refining and dumping can take place. Some places on Earth will be turned into waste dumping areas, presumably in the global south. For instance, one ton of lithium extraction from brines requires 1.9 million tons of water. This has already depleted water resources, spoiling agriculture in the Andean Lithium Triangle. Chemical runoffs also pollute rivers in Chile, Argentina and Tibet, threatening entire freshwater ecosystems. Sacrifice zones are what the experts call such places. As if things weren't bad enough, geopolitical tensions are disrupting global value chains and will continue to do so in the coming decades. The withdrawal of Russian resources behind an iron curtain will challenge Western procurement of strategic minerals, especially for Washington, which is fully import dependent for 17 key minerals and more than half dependent for 29 others. The fallout from the Ukraine war could be a sign of things to come. In February 2022, aluminium and nickel prices hit their all-time highs before falling, albeit to a higher baseline. And since Russia accounts for 15% of global nickel exports, one quarter of vanadium oxide exports and one fifth of palladium exports, supply disruptions remains an ongoing concern. America, one of the largest producers of greenhouse emissions and a harbinger of policymaking, is the key. Washington may seek to nearshore or friendshore its mineral needs via partnerships with countries like Canada, Norway, Finland and Spain. A May 2023 critical minerals agreement with Australia may prove a blueprint for America's supply chains. However, the fact remains that Beijing holds the cards when it comes to processing and refining. The Chinese share of refining is around 35% for nickel, 60% for lithium, 70% for cobalt and as high as 90% for rare earths. Beijing is ahead of the competition and is now branching out in other ways, seeking to control supply chains across the board.
much like Henry Ford's efforts to control Amazonian rubber for car manufacturing, China has consolidated its presence in states like the Democratic Republic of Congo, where 46% of global cobalt reserves are found. These days, Ford and Tesla buy components fashioned from minerals extracted in Chinese-owned mines. In the case of copper and nickel, around half of the global production is concentrated in six countries. Meanwhile, roughly 40% of global manganese reserves are found in South Africa, and 28% of the world's graphite reserves are mainly in Turkey. The location of these resources, both at the point of extraction and further down the line, could place a chokehold on the flow of green minerals. And given that the International Energy Agency predicts by 2030 more cobalt mines will be going offline than coming online, such concerns will persist into the future. Alternatively, the United States could pursue nuclear energy. But here too it depends on Moscow. Under a 1993 agreement, Washington annually purchases $1 billion of enriched uranium from the Russian company Rosatom. At the time, the deal helped ease geopolitical tensions. Yet, the low cost of Russian materials ran America's refining industry out of business. And even if all goes well, revamping America's domestic industry could take at least a decade. Still, there may be no other choice. Rolling out nuclear energy on a mass scale presents a feasible tool for decarbonization. Standardized designs like Open 100's 100 MW nuclear reactor could facilitate mass construction of power plants while lowering maintenance and overhead costs. But building the facilities needed would still be expensive and raise proliferation concerns. Replacing Britain's installed nuclear capacity alone, for instance, would cost at least $400 billion. The biggest issue, though, is the several decade time horizon. So, while nuclear energy could play a role in the green transition, decarbonizing by 2050 is unlikely. As it stands, though, the sourcing, refining and disposal of green materials could precipitate new conflicts between the great powers overall and between the middle powers in the global south. Ergo, resource conflicts are here to stay. Energy ultimately is the lifeblood of any economy. Because a machine without energy is a statue, and a body without energy is a corpse. Now, this video's sponsor is FE Battery Metals, a company that focuses on identifying, exploring and advancing early stage lithium projects in Canada. Lithium is the trade of the decade, especially in North America. Electric vehicle makers are now getting involved in mining and processing lithium. They're not leaving it to chance or broken supply chains, and who can blame them? Volvo, Ford and General Motors plan to invest hundreds of millions of dollars to source lithium directly. At the heart of this dilemma is FE Battery Metals, their ticker being FEMFF. According to the International Energy Association, EV battery demand will require 50 lithium projects by 2030. But currently, there is only one active lithium mine in the United States. A second one in Canada is scheduled to commence operations soon. It's perhaps the hottest lithium mining territory in North America, and recent actions speak for themselves. A $2 billion behemoth lithium producer from Australia is setting up shop in the vicinity. They're investing hundreds of millions of dollars and acquiring projects around the Canadian prospects putting their minds into production as soon as humanly possible. Whoever controls the essential minerals of the world will get to dictate terms in geopolitics. That's how we ended up with the petrodollar. FE Battery Metals, being a relatively smaller player, is staking land and drilling for lithium. They have one of the largest land holdings in Quebec, knowing that in this mining camp, the chances of getting bought out are very likely if they get some positive results. 
That's how it goes in this business. The best place to mine is near other mines. FE Battery Metals Ticker FEMFF has a market cap of $18 million right now, so it fits like a glove into this script. Now, I'm not saying the company is being acquired, but they are sitting next to multi-billion dollar lithium companies. Ergo, they are a prime acquisition target once they make a positive discovery mining-wise. Just for added context, the 2020 Yukon Prospector of the Year is their chief geologist. He's actually a board member of FE Battery Metals. So, to sum things up, lithium supply outpaces demand, there is barely any lithium mining ongoing in North America, we're still early to the party, and the location is terrific. Currently, the stock is trading at 51 cents a share, so if you pick up a few shares, you would be out only a few bucks. Once positive drilling results are announced, what usually happens is that the stock skyrockets. I'm not saying that is going to happen, no one can predict the market, what I'm saying is this company checks all the boxes. And I've invested in such companies before, it hasn't always paid out, but when the opening share is low, the risk is worth it. Plus, these are the companies that are actively pulling minerals out of the ground, minerals we need for net zero, and then bringing them to markets. I'll have the link to their website in the description below, go check out their latest drilling projects. And as always, thank you for your time and Savol.